What's going on, Colts fans? Welcome back to another episode of Colts Brawl. I am your host, Cody Felger. Joining me, your other host, Michael Terrazas. Michael, how are you doing, my friend? Hey, man, I'm doing good, doing good. Uh, currently, you know, in uh, San Antonio for my brother's wedding. So currently uh, getting ready for that, excited for that, but also excited about uh, to talk about some Colts football, man. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, on our Colts Brawl Twitter page, if you haven't, you can follow it at Colts Brawl. Um, our social media guy, Justin, he was putting out um, some different polls because he wanted to do something on the Colts all-decade team. So he was putting out different polls on different positions. He started with the quarterback position, and I want to kind of get your take on it. Um, I think this one is pretty straightforward. Uh, the, be- the best quarterback in the Colts all-decade team, that being 2010 through 2019. Only three choices, Peyton Manning, Andrew Luck, Jacoby Brissett. Um, Andrew Luck won in a landslide, 63%. Uh, Michael, I think this one's pretty straightforward. I mean, Andrew Luck was the quarterback for the Colts 2012 all the way up to 2018. Definitely was the guy. You know, as good as Peyton Manning was, he was only really under center for the Colts one year in this decade. Uh, what are your thoughts here on Andrew Luck winning that? Uh, for the all-decade team, uh, it, it doesn't surprise me, man. It was a uh, it was a good vote. Uh, you know, he, as much as we all love Peyton Manning, man, I, I love me some Peyton Manning. To be honest, man, even if it was an all-decade team, I think I still love Andrew Luck more than Peyton Manning, man. I, I, it was just something about Andrew Luck that just he would just motivate you to run through a brick wall. Like, he just left it all out there. He loved everything about the game. He loved everything about football, his teammates, about the Colts. He loved it all, man. And growing up as a Colts fan, you know, becoming a teenager, becoming into a man, Andrew Luck was the guy for me. And I'm probably saying, that, you know, a 40-year-old might disagree with me. He might go Peyton Manning. But for me, dude, Andrew Luck was just, he was phenomenal. As many times as he he got hurt, as many times as, you know, he would throw interceptions, if, you know, they would lose games, man, he never, ever made excuses, dude. As horrible as his offensive line was, as horrible as his running backs were, he never made excuses. He went out there and he put the entire franchise on his back. And unfortunately, we all know what that led to. But, you know, for Andrew, man, as long as he's happy, you know, as long as he uh, had a good career, I think he did have a good career. Uh, was it a Hall of Fame career? I, you know, that's probably a discussion for another day. But I definitely side with the fans on this one, going with Andrew Luck for the all-decade team. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And it's a bummer that it only it's Andrew Luck's only from 2012 to 2018 because, we, uh, yeah, we feel like if Andrew Luck would have had the proper protection and the proper pieces around him, he would still be the Colts quarterback. And so it's just a bummer to see that. Um, but, yeah, I definitely agree. Andrew Luck, no doubt, was the face of the franchise for the Colts through the 2010s um, and certainly was a guy that, you know, a lot of people looked up to. I mean, huge, huge fan of Andrew Luck and just sad to, to see him no longer under center for the Colts. But, uh, okay, we can move on to the running backs now for the all-decade team. This one was a little bit more surprising for me. There were the choices, Joseph Adai, Frank Gore, Marlon Mack. And Joseph Adai actually won this one, which I thought was really weird because Joseph Adai only played really, you know, a couple of years for the Colts in the 2010s. You know, maybe if that's more of a – uh, 2000s more so, I can see Joseph Adai being in that conversation. But, you know, for the 2010s, it didn't make much sense to me why Joseph Adai had one because I honestly feel like guys like Frank Gore or Marlon Mack, I mean, did more than Joseph Adai did even in a couple of years that they were here. Um, what are your thoughts here on this one, Michael? Uh, this is a tricky one, man. This is a tricky one because we probably out of all three of these guys, uh, it's a good it, – it's a talented group of running backs. Marlon Mack, who's the guy right now, Frank Gore, we know, you know, 
not still not having a running uh, an offensive line, but he was still uh, he could still put up some numbers. And Joseph Adai, I mean, you know what he brought to the table, game in and game out, a, a physical running back. You know, he, he was everything the Colts wanted him to be. This one, the running back always seems to be tricky in any situation. But with this one, I would probably – oh, man, the reason why it's so tricky is because, Cody, we haven't had much production out of the running back position. We haven't. Mm-hmm. We went, what was it, like four years without a 100-yard rusher? Yeah. It was yeah. a long time. So it's really hard to say who is the all-decade running back. Hell, we could might we might as well add Jonathan Taylor in there, even though he just got drafted. But, <laughs> right. I, I, but I mean, overall, I would probably have to go Marlon Mack because of what you said. It was only one year. He was with the Colts, um, and with Frank Gore, you know, he was an Iron Man. He didn't get injured. He always did everything the Colts asked him to do. Uh, was no production, was no offensive line. But with Marlon Mack, he's produced. He's caught the ball out of the backfield. He's ran between the tackles. He showed some – he's shown really good uh, traits of a good running back. So with that one, you know, he just had a 1,000-yard year. Last year he had 900 rushing yards, even though he missed like six games in 2018. So with because of that, when I look at the production – I'm going to go with Marlon Mack. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's tricky. I'm torn between Frank Gore and Marlon Mack. I almost wonder, say Mar- say Frank Gore went, ran behind this offensive line, how much more productive he could have been. Uh, but that's neither the here or there. So uh, moving on now to uh, the wide receivers. He actually posted two different polls. Uh, the first one is the wide receiver number one for the All-Decade team. The, the choice is Reggie Wayne, Pierre Garçon, T.Y. Hilton, Zach Paschal. Uh, Reggie Wayne pretty much destroyed in that one. Uh, Reggie Wayne had 49%, T.Y. Hilton 39%, and then he went on and asked wide receiver two. T.Y. Hilton undoubtedly um, smoked the other two options. So um, I think that one's pretty cut and dry. I mean, both these wide receivers were phenomenal for the Colts. Um, You know, Reggie Wayne, I would say I was a little bit surprised that Reggie Wayne actually beat out T.Y. Hilton for the wide receiver number one because, you know, we're looking at the 2010s. We're not looking – at the 2000s and Reggie Wayne fantastic receiver hall of future hall of famer for the Colts but T.Y. Hilton was drafted he's played seven years in this decade compared to Reggie Wayne only playing four years I don't know if I really agree with this honestly oh man another tough one because you know what T.Y. Hilton brings to the table he is the toughest guy on this team he just he, he just always finds a way to get open. He always produces and just poof, pulls another rabbit out of the hat. For Reggie Wayne, you know, it could be a big what if for Reggie Wayne's career if he didn't tear his ACL in 2013. Because I definitely think he probably could have retired like in 2016, if I'm being honest. He could have lasted until 2016. But that tore an ACL, obviously, it did some damage. But with Reggie Wayne, I mean, look, in that 2012 season, he was Andrew Luck's big brother. You know, he was the – everyone thought Reggie Wayne was going to leave Indianapolis and follow Peyton Manning to Denver. But that didn't happen. He stayed with the horseshoe. He stayed there, rode with Andrew Luck. With this one, man, I honestly think I'm going to have to go with T.Y. Hilton. Uh, When I look at everything, both of these wide receivers, incredibly tough incredibly skilled you know Reggie Wayne has a Super Bowl T.Y. Hilton doesn't yet but T.Y. Hilton is up there in the Colts record books he is up there with Marvin Harrison with Reggie Wayne I mean he's the closest to them than I think any other wide receiver is so when I look at the decade everything that T.Y. Hilton T.Y. Hilton hasn't had any help he hasn't Darius Hayward Bay is not help I actually had some hope for Hakeem Nix, he ended up to be nothing. Andre Johnson, that was just a hype signing. Uh, You know, all that, T.Y. Hilton had nothing to work with. 
it was him getting the double teams, it was him getting the triple teams, all the all the uh, attention from opposing defensive coordinators, and yet he still went out there, he still made plays. So for that reason alone, man, uh, he's played longer, he's produced incredibly. Reggie Wayne, he played with Marvin Harrison, that helped him out a lot, and we saw what Reggie Wayne could be once Marvin Harrison left. But T.Y. Hilton has dealt with a lot more than I can say that Reggie Wayne did in his younger career. So for that reason, Mm -hmm. I'm going with T.Y. Hilton for wide receiver number one. Yeah, and you also you throw in all that stuff you already said. You have to look at the quarterback also. He played with Andrew Luck, but he also, I believe now Philip Rivers will be the ninth quarterback that T.Y. Hilton has played with in his career. I mean, Reggie Wayne, who did he have? Peyton Manning, Andrew Luck, I mean – he had a lot of good quarterbacks throwing the ball to him. Um, and, you know, T.Y. Hilton's just had a lot of different quarterbacks. He had Andrew Luck. Yeah, that's been fantastic for him. But he's also had guys like Charlie Whitehurst, Jacoby Brissett, Scott Tolzien, some of those guys, now Phillip Rivers. And so it's just it's just a whole different story here. It really is. And I think that's something that can't be understated. You already mentioned you know, playing alongside Marvin Harrison. I mean, he was also playing alongside guys like Dallas Clark and Stokely, guys that can let him get open. And T.Y. Hilton, you know, hasn't really had that really at all. Um, besides when Reggie Wayne, you know, the last few years of Reggie Wayne's career, he has not had that even close to what Re- to what Reggie Wayne had, the supporting cast no. Reggie Wayne had. So um, I definitely agree with you there. I do think it should be T.Y then Reggie for this decade. Now, overall career, I'd probably say Reggie T.Y., but oh yeah, just looking at it from that standpoint, yeah, I'm definitely going to go T.Y. and Reggie there. Um, and then moving on then to the tight end position, um, it was the choices of Dallas Clark, Kobe Fleener, Jack Doyle, and Eric Ebron. It's kind of funny because all these guys except for one were high-round picks. Dallas Clark was, I believe, was he a first-round pick? I don't even remember. I thought he was a pretty high pick, though. Uh, Eric Ebron was a former first-round pick. Kobe Fleener, a former second-round pick. And then you have a guy in Jack Doyle, undrafted free agent out of Kentucky, who he just, you know, he's just come in in 2016, and he has just been such a reliable pass catcher for all the quarterbacks under center. And uh, he takes the cake here, 66% of the voting, which I think is phenomenal. I'm a big Jack Doyle guy myself. I think it, undoubtedly Jack Doyle and then Dallas Clark came in second. I think Jack Doyle undoubtedly is the guy uh, that deserves the all decade at the tight end position for the Colts. Yeah, on this one, it was pretty cut, cut clear and dry. Uh, for the first guy, I'm not even going to mention his name. He quit on the team. Uh, he really didn't do much except for when he had a superstar quarterback that basically made him relevant so moving on from him Kobe Fleener I mean he was a solid tight end uh obviously he was Peyton uh Peyton uh Andrew Luck's teammate at Stanford and you know they had a chemistry already built he actually did some nice things for the Colts uh you know (laughs) yeah he went to New Orleans and ended up not doing anything so that just shows you how good Andrew Luck was And then you get down to the next two. You look at Jack Doyle, and then you look at Dallas Clark. I mean, Dallas Clark, he, what, retired in like 11 or or so. So then you look at Jack Doyle. I mean, he came in undrafted, and then he's been one of the better tight ends in the NFL, one of the more consistent tight ends in the NFL. I mean, you look at guys like Jason Witten. When you look at guys like um, Zach Ertz, when you look at those guys, I mean, what Jason Witten was in his early career, he was great. Jack Doyle, he is great. I mean, if he was a focal point of the offense, which I think he he should become, he has shown the ability to be reliable, and I think he's earned the spot of earning a higher role in this offense. Jack Doyle, for me, is the easy pick here. I love me some Dallas Clark, man. Don't get me wrong. I love Dallas Clark, but Jack Doyle, his story, what he had to work with, what he worked himself from, and he's now a vocal leader in the offense, on the team, and he's a security blanket for Jacoby Brissett, Phillip Rivers, or Jacob Eason. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so those are the ones that were posted on the Colts Brawl page. If you haven't checked them out yet, be sure to do that on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Colts Brawl. Um, but now I want to move into some topics around the Colts here. Um, the first one being Paris Campbell, right? Former second round pick, second round pick in 2019. And uh, he's a guy that last year he missed nine games with injury, kind of multiple different injuries. But he's a guy that the Colts envision using him in a lot of ways. And I know that Frank Reich talked to the media and was basically saying if he could stay healthy, we envision Paris Campbell being involved very heavily in this offense. Um, what are your thoughts here on what you think Paris Campbell, if he's healthy, how do you think he could potentially help this Colts offense in a variety of different ways, Michael? If Paris Campbell can get healthy, I'm just going to say this real quick to open up, that the Colts have a shot to have one of the better wide receiver groups in the NFL. I mean, you look at T.Y. Hilton, you know what he has. If Michael Pittman can come in and do exactly what he did at USC and even better, still grow as a wide receiver, and then Paris Campbell, look, Frank Wright came out and already said Paris Campbell is going to work a ton from the slot. So you already know T.Y., Michael Pittman on the outside. On the inside, it's going to be Paris Campbell, okay? He is going to be breaking the game open. That's why they brought him in. That's what they were talking about his rookie year. You know, his rookie year, he, he didn't, you know, see a lot of stuff because of those injuries. Frank Reich wanted to go easy on him a little bit. I mean, one touchdown – 18 receptions, 127 yards. It's not all that impressive. And, of course, Jacoby Brissett wasn't really hitting him all that well. But with Phillip Rivers, Paris Campbell, if Frank Wright can scheme Paris Campbell open, he has that game-breaking potential, Tyreek Hill-like potential. He has the speed. He has the vision for the field. You just have to get the ball in his hands. And a couple of times, you saw you saw it in Campbell. The my biggest moment from that is when I saw him in Pittsburgh. He had a couple. That was probably his best game of his rookie year. He had some good runs, some good uh, jet sweeps. He had some good stuff in that game. But for Paris Campbell, it's going to be about health. Early on, I believe he's healthy as can be right now. That's going to be big, okay? Still learning from T.Y. Hilton, still learning the route tree, getting better and more polished as a route runner. That's going to be big for Campbell. He, If he gets his act together, if he can be what we think he can be, look out because the Colts can have one of the more lethal wide receiver groups in the NFL. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, I guess that kind of answers the next point I was going to ask. You know, with with Paris Campbell, can T.Y. Hilton and Michael Pittman potentially be, even from day one, one of the best wide receiver duos in the league? We know they have the potential to be lethal, but how lethal could they potentially be even, you know, week one of the 2020 season? I'll say this. I feel like when it comes to T.Y. Hilton, it's not all hype with him. He just goes out there and does his job and performs. Then Michael Pittman, look, I've listened to a lot of Michael Pittman interviews. He almost reminds me of T.Y. Hilton. He's all business. He gets out there on the field. He works his tail off. He works on his craft, and he wants to get better. I'll, I'll, I will say this, man. On pure talent, I'll probably take that duo in Cleveland. But right now, dude, when it comes to just going out there, getting it done, shutting up, doing your job, working hard, I'll probably take T.Y. and Michael Pittman over Jarvis Landry and Odell Beckham Jr. because they haven't performed in Cleveland. But when you look at the potential of T.Y. Hilton and Michael Pittman Jr., T.Y. Hilton, T.Y. Hilton can do it all. We've seen that. We've, we know all that. But when you look at Michael Pittman, he is the deep threat. Not only do you have him, but T.Y. is also a deep threat. If one is running underneath, one is running over the top, vice versa. You know how good these wide receivers can be. On Michael Pittman, his hands are just solid. They almost remind me of 
Reggie Wayne hands. Four years at USC, he only had five drops at USC. That is, if he can become a Reggie Wayne, or if he can just simply do what he did at USC, T.Y. Hilton and Michael Pittman Jr. can become one of the most, if not the most lethal wide receiver group in or duo in the NFL. I know, you know, when you look around the league, I mean, even the Cowboys, they just got C.D. Lamb. Him and Amari Cooper, they're going to do some good things. When you look at Cleveland, you see them. When you look in Arizona, Larry Fitzgerald, DeAndre Hopkins, you see all this around the league. But Larry Fitzgerald is kind of like a T.Y. Hilton. T.Y. Hilton is kind of like a Fitzgerald in my mind. He goes out there, he's underrated, but he performs so much. With Hilton and Pittman, man, I am putting the sky's the limit for this duo. Obviously, T.Y. Hilton is getting older, so we'll probably see this duo for the next probably three, four years. But it could be a very strong three or four years for whoever is quarterbacking the Indianapolis Colts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And throwing in, even throwing in a guy like Zach Pascal, I don't think can be underrated as well, like understated as well, rather. He's a guy that has come on last year. You know, he was a Colts leading receiver. I mean, a guy that came out, you know, was under another undrafted guy. Um, the Colts picked up, and he's another guy that's just performed. And Zach Pascal, year after year, he's, you know, he came with the Colts in 2018. And in 2019, he had even a better year. Um, so he kind of fits into maybe that number three, number four, depending on what happens with Paris Campbell. And so you just throw in some of those guys, like, this wide receiver group has the potential to be very special for the Colts. And I, I think that's something that, you know, fans have to, should be excited about because it's, it is really awesome um, just to see all the potential, you know, obviously stuff happens. We know that injuries happen, but if all these guys can stay healthy for a year, it'll be really interested, interesting for me to see how can these guys perform together all healthy because the potential, like you said, Michael, it is through the roof with these guys. I mean, they have so much potential, so much talent on in that wide receiver group. Now, if they can all stay healthy and if they can all perform like we think they can perform, it could truly be a very special year for the Colts wide receiver core. So I definitely agree with you there on that front. Um, lead, talking about Michael Pittman and some of these rookies, um, I'm kind of curious. Maybe it is Michael Pittman. Maybe it's somebody else. Um, which rookie do you think is going to have the biggest impact in 2020? Oh, man. You know, I think a lot of people would probably immediately point to Jonathan Taylor, and I think he's the easy choice here. I mean, he's the running back. He's going to be getting the ball. I mean, other than the quarterback, the running back is probably the second player who touches the ball the most on the team. So when I'm looking at that, I'll probably go Jonathan Taylor, but I've I've entertained the idea. I think I'm going to go with Julian Blackman. If I'm being honest, I think, you know, if it's that gut feeling, I I don't know, man, about Malik Hooker's future with the Colts, but I think Julian Blackman is going to become, you know, come strong onto the scene like a Kari Willis did for the Colts. He's going to come in. I, it's still to be determined if he'll be good to go by the season start or he'll start the season on PUP physically unable to perform. He'll be out for the first five, eight games for, of the season. But I'm I'm going to go ahead and say he's ready to go by the start of the season. Looking at Julian Blackman and the things that he did at Utah, he's so instinctive. You know, he just he j- can just see what's coming. He His recognition for the game, for the play in front of him, is just good. He has some good speed. Now, obviously, coming off an ACL, we might see a reduction in speed. But one thing that I'm probably sure will not be reduced in any way is how good of a tackler he is. So I've been moving in this direction. I think Julian Blackman will be a pretty solid name for the Colts, not only in his rookie campaign, but for the future. I mean, I think 
I think I'm going to go with Jonathan Taylor just because, you know, obviously we know how, how great of a back he was. Wisconsin, and, you know, that's going to help the Colts running game also. You know, seventh last year could be a potential top three running game. But I also look at the impact on what how it helps Marlon Mack, right? How it helps the rest of the running backs and how it helps the running game in the durability standpoint. Because, you know, Marlon Mack has been dinged up year after year. He hasn't played a full 16-game season since he was drafted in 2017. And so I think it could have a bigger impact, you know, just not even what he does, but, you know, what it does for a guy like Marlon Mack. You know, so whenever that happens, you know, these guys can get their touches, but they can also get some rest, you know, some rest. They can also be able to, you know, be more durable for later on down the season, you know, when injuries do happen. Um, they can be more durable and less likely to get injured. And so that's kind of why I would say Jonathan Taylor, because obviously the production, but also just the impact it'll have on the durability of a guy like Marlon Mack. I think that can't be understated as well. Um, And the last point we kind of wanted to talk about today, Michael, um, Darius Leonard, right? A guy, he's been phenomenal ever since he was drafted from by the Colts in 2018, the second round, Um, you know, first team all pro his rookie year, defensive rookie of the year team all pro this last year and then now the bit you know one of Darius Leonard's things that when he's asked some of his goals one of them is to be the defensive MVP you know he said that so he said pro bowl all pro defensive MVP now he's done pro bowl and all pro but he's not yet been the defensive MVP so that leads me to my question on this point can Darius Leonard potentially be the defensive MVP in 2020 oh man you know that <laughs> when it comes to Darius Leonard, man, if he says it's one of his goals, I'm gonna go ahead and take him on his word and say he'll reach it, because that's just the kind of player he is. It still shocks me that he was playing at South Carolina State and not at a program like Clemson. It it shocks me, but that just shows how much he's grown. If he wants to go for the defensive player of the year or the MVP of the league. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible for a defensive player to win the MVP because obviously the quarterback position is growing. It's go- growing more lethal at the quarterback award. But with Darius Leonard, I want to break this down here. Piggybacking off of what I said about Julian Blackman, if he, Malik Hooker, and Kari Willis can – form a strong tandem at safety. That's going to be good for the back end. That is going to be great for the deep threat because now that quarterback will have to eliminate those deep threats. He can't go there anymore. He's going to have to go underneath. And where's underneath? You got Darius Leonard there. He's good in pass coverage. He has the speed. He has the long arms. Now, when you look at the defensive line, he's going to be playing behind one of the best defensive tackles in the league in DeForest Buckner. If he can beat his man, beat those double teams, I mean, we forget that Darius Leonard can rack up sacks too. He can rack up sacks. If he has an extraordinary year, he has some good things working for him on defense. You know, adding DeForest Buckner is big. Also having Justin Houston is big. Also having guys like Kari Willis, Malik Hooker, Kenny Moore, Rocky Sin, hopefully Julian Blackman and Xavier Rhodes are really good. We know Darius Leonard is the alpha and leader of this defense. And everything is going to be focused on him when it comes to pass coverage, run game, forcing turnovers. It's there. I mean, he has, what, seven, what is it, seven interceptions so far through two years, I think it is. Um well, we had like five last sacks. year. Yeah, 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 like 12 sacks and then all kinds of tackles. So you see a lot, a lot of that. You see a strong secondary and hopefully a strong pass rush. That's going to lead to maybe some dump downs, maybe p- passing it to the running back, passing it to a hitch route, a slant route, leading to easy tackles, hopefully interceptions for Darius Leonard. It is completely possible, Cody. I mean, this guy, I mean, if you want to doubt him, if you want to say he can't get it, I mean, do that at your own risk. But, I mean, 
even if I wasn't a Colts fan, I still wouldn't doubt this guy. So, yeah, he can become a defensive player of the year easily. For the league MVP, oh, man, he's going to have to rack up that uh, that stat sheet. But I think it's definitely possible because he does have those good things around him working. Yeah, it would be absolutely wild if he had a triple-triple, if you will, tackles, interceptions, and sacks. That would be absolutely crazy if he had double digits on all of those. Um, that would be wild to me to just even see that happen. Um, yeah, I think that he he definitely has that potential and that motivation to be you know, the defensive player of the year. Um, we know Aaron Donald. We know how great Aaron Donald is. Um, but Darius Leonard has just been phenomenal ever since he was drafted, and he still has a chip on his shoulder. He's still being disrespected. And so I think it's certainly going to be interesting to see him now you know, with some of these additions you mentioned on defense, how much that helps him and allows him to even bring his game to another level um, and, and continue to build up his resume to potentially be uh, a candidate for defensive player of the year, or even NFL MVP. It'll certainly be interesting to see. Hopefully he can play all 16 games and not get banged up like he did last year. I certainly think playing alongside Anthony Walker and Bobby Okariki will also help him a lot. Um, so it'll, yeah, it's certainly going to be an interesting year to see um, the Colts have done a little bit of an overhaul on their defense this last offseason. And so it'll be interesting to see how much that benefits a guy like Darius Leonard. And, you know, does that help him bring his game to another level and also help build his resume um, for whenever that stuff does happen? But all righty, well, cool. I think that wraps up this episode of Colts Broth, a little bit shorter than what we normally do. Um, but that's kind of the nature of the offseason. Not a ton of content to talk about right now. Um, I know that Frank Reich recently met with the media, so if you guys are craving Colts content, be sure to check that out. I think it's on YouTube. Um, be sure to leave us a like, a comment. Let us know your thoughts on some of the polls, you know, some of the topics that we came up with today. Um, we'd love to hear your take on it. But, uh, yeah, I think that, that'll do it for this episode of Colts Brawl. For Michael and myself, thank you guys so much for listening, and stay safe out there.